in between then, we want to take a moment out. We want to talk and we want to refocus. We want to do this every once in a while in our church uh, to really focus on what God calls us to be. And I said last week, and I really mean this, that, that I really think that we are invested in, in what God has called us to do. But I also think that we're becoming more and more invested. And so in other words, I think we're invested. I think we believe that God really has called us to exalt Christ and to point others to him. I really believe that he's given us a mindset as a church as a whole. And yet I believe that God is, in, God is building in us and wanting us to grow more and more and more in that. Right? We've not arrived. If you've thought you've come to a church that's arrived, uh, you're probably in the wrong place. I don't know where you're going to find it, but, but we're, we're getting there. and we're, we're seeking truly to understand what God would have for us. And so last week we went back to that very base passage, and it really is a base passage of Jesus as he commissions his disciple. Matter of fact, we call it the Great Commission. Right, where he commands us, and I told you last week, there's only one command in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Only one, and that is to make disciples. And so we're called to make disciples. And not only, we're called to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And we're all called to that. That's what we're called to do. We're not just called to make um, um, salvations. You can take that off, Jenna, not till I get there. Uh, you can, we're not called to, to make uh, decisions. We're not called to just have people fill out a form. We're called to make people who follow Jesus, who get to know Jesus, and get to know him so well that they can help others to know Jesus, who can then help others to know Jesus. And so that's what we're called to. And so, and so we understand that in our church, and we dug deep into that, and I challenged you uh, even about being a discipler or being a disciplee, to be one who would be willing to even sit with others uh, that might be to learn and to grow and to be challenged in your faith, and it might be to, to challenge and grow others, and you can do that even in different relationships at the same time. And so everybody, everybody needs to be discipled um, because that's what we're called to do. We're called to make disciples. And so, and so this next two weeks, this week and next week, we're going to concentrate on this wonderful mission statement that's original to us, exalting Christ and pointing others to him, that God has called us to, and I really firmly believe, like I said, we're invested in this, but we're, we're becoming more and more invested in it, right? And God is, God is really doing a new thing among us, and I love it. I love what he's doing in our church. I love how he's challenging us and growing us. I love the people that are coming here. You know, we, we celebrated baptism three weeks ago, and new life in people, and there's others who couldn't make it, and so we're going to be doing a baptism again this summer, and so... You know, it's just exciting to see God move and God move in and through us, right? To use us for his glory, to use us for his glory. And so today, like I said, we're going to focus on that. And so we're going to cut off even, even our mission statements on two sides. So we're going to take this side today. So the left side, right? I want to say it's the right side. It's the left side. We're going to talk about the left side today and about exalting Christ because we've got to understand what that means. Why would we exalt Christ? Why really is Christ our center? Why is he the one we focus on and we look to? Right? Why isn't it about us? Why can't it be about us? I mean, really the world tells us it really is about us. The, really, the world tells us it should be about us. And, and God says, nope, not at all. Shouldn't be about us at all. Matter of fact, I love the movement. You might have seen some of these videos out there. Of, and they usually try to get people who are popular or people who are, who are named, I should say, you know, that, that are named out there. And they give their testimony of salvation in Jesus Christ. And it's, it's called I Am Second. You can look it up. I Am Second. And uh, it's really cool. I mean, and, and they always end with I Am Second. And guess what? That's the reality of it. I'm not first. I'm not, I'm not number one. We want to say, oh, I'm number one. You've know, you got to look out for number one. Listen, I, I, I'm of Jesus, and, and he's my number one, right? He's my number one, and that's where I need to be. Uh, so we're going to go to this mission verse, and we've been here before, um, because this is really where our mission verse comes out of. So if you have your Bibles, if you would open up to Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, this way you can throw it up there, so... Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to talk about, I, I just love this passage. Um, 
in Colossians, all the way through the first chapter, it really just hones in on Jesus and the mission and what it is. And I love it because even as we were, even as we were saying, Lord, can you just do a new thing in us and, and help us to really have a clearer vision of what your mission for Grace Gospel Church is so that we can, you know, put it in this thing. And, and, and for a mission statement, you, wanna, you really want something clear and you want something concise. You want something that we can all memorize. I pray, Lord knows I say it enough. You know, exalting Christ and pointing others to him. I hope you understand that. I hope you remember that. And I hope when you evaluate, when you think of our church, when someone says, what's your church about? I really pray this is what our church is about. It's exalting Christ and pointing others to him. I mean, that's, that's really what, that we're, what we're about. And what we want to be about. See, because it's not about our kingdom. We, we, we talked last week about, about what we desire to do and what we desire to be. And that we truly are striving to be a Holy Spirit empowered movement of God on mission to build his kingdom, right? That's what our, we're desiring to be. That's what we're striving to be in Christ because of what he has called us to do. And really, we've got to understand this first. Because if you don't understand why we exalt Christ, why we point to Christ, and if Christ really isn't the center, then pointing others to him doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. I mean, it just becomes kind of a, a logo or a statement, and it, and it becomes something cute, maybe, you know, that we can put on our shirts, or that we can put on our bookmarks, or that we can put someplace else, but it doesn't make any sense. If Christ isn't our all in all, first and foremost, then why in the world do I need to point them there? Then you start beginning to point them to our church, or you begin to start pointing them to look like you, or then we begin to build disciples, but not disciples of Jesus, disciples of us. And I'm here to tell you, I think we have one of the best churches on Long Island. I truly believe that truly believe that. But I got to tell you, as good as we are, we don't need to make disciples of us. We need to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's what we need to talk to. So, so let's go back. We're going we're gonna to take just a second. I want you to understand what Paul is talking to here um, uh, and, and, and kind of what is happening. So he is fighting, just like in 2 Corinthians, just like in other places, people come in and there's this infiltration um, it, for this, for the Colossian church specifically, but there's this infiltration of, of Judaizers. And, and as we get along in time, it's beginning to, to, to grow into flower. So everything that is alive, that's healthy, grows, including weeds. They do. As a matter of fact, weeds take over. Right? Danielle calls them noxious weeds. As a matter of fact, she, she'll, she'll, she'll plant flowers and she'll be like, oh man, that thing's a noxious weed because all of a sudden it's taking everything over. Right? You know, you put it in at some point to make it highlight all these other flowers. I, I don't. You heard me say that, right? Danielle does because there ain't no way I'm doing that. But um, I just because I don't, I can't see nothing like that, you know. But I, I admire it. So, but, but pretty soon you plant something and it's all, yesterday she was, what were you digging out? Lily of the Valley. I guess that thing just grows everywhere, and it spreads every place. And it's really nice when you want to cover something until it takes over everything else you got, right? Well, that's what weeds do. I mean, I know it's pretty weed, right? I know it's, you know, but, but you look at our yard. I mean, Vic and I talk all the time about how we're fighting the weeds in our yards all the time. Dandelions and, and, and crabgrass and all this other kind of stuff that just wants to take everything over. Well, guess what? Weeds in the church tend to take everything over also. And heresy, it's amazing how much heresy can begin to take off and flower and bloom. And even if it looks pretty, you know, I mean, you know, for a lot of years, you mamas that had young children, you know, they used to pick flowers for you all the time, right? They used to pick that dandelion and bring it in. And it was really pretty. I mean, it's yellow and it's bright and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, oh, thank you, baby. <laughs> you know, and then, and then pretty soon you're out there, dad's out there trying to, where'd that one come from? Let me dig it out. Right, let me kill that sucker. Right, so those weeds. So that's what's happening in here. But like I said, it's beginning to blossom, blossom and, and, and bloom. And really what we have here in the Colossian church is a pre-Gnostic heresy. Now, if you don't know what Gnosticism is, let me, I'm not even going to read you uh, a commentator and what it says. It's this. This false teaching seemed to be 
the beginning of what was later really fully developed. Gnosticism was fully developed in the second century, came out in full bloom, but this is kind of the undertones of it. So it says this, it contains several characteristics. It was Jewish, stressing the need for observing Old Testament laws and ceremonies. It was philosophical, laying emphasis on some special or deeper knowledge. That's what gnosis means in the Greek. Some, some sort of, you know, so Gnostic, this, this special knowledge, just this underlying meaning of the scriptures. You've got to kind of, you know, put on your right glasses, I always, get, I always get worried, even in Bible study, when someone says, well, but what is the real meaning? It's like, what do you mean the real meaning? Well, what is, it, what is it saying underneath? There's nothing being said underneath. I don't know. What's the spiritual meaning? That's how we put it sometimes. What's the spiritual meaning of the passage? What, what does that mean? You know, like somehow we have to find this hidden message that is in there that only special people get, right? It involved worship of angels, as mediators to God, it was exclusive, stressing the special privilege and perfection of a select few who belong to the philosophical elite. In other words, you can, you know, you're the ones who could really see what was really happening. It was also Christological. In other words, it, it was centered on Christ in a sense, but then you added all this other stuff, uh, heresy. Uh, it says, but the seminal Gnosticism denied the, the deity of Christ, thus calling forth one of the greatest declarations of Christ's deity found anywhere in scripture as we talk about it here. And uh, so he's dealing with this, 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 again, pre-Gnostic kind of heresies that's blooming because that's what happens. Weeds bloom, even weeds in the church and heresies. And, and we want to say, well, you know, they're just a little off. You know, they're just a little off. And let me tell you, we've got to be patient with people. We can't be beating them over the head. You know, we've got to give them patience. And, and so often... Or too often, too many people, you know, somebody says something wrong, we want to beat them up, and we want to throw them out kind of thing. And we've got to be careful with that. We've got to give them room to grow. But that does not mean that we allow the, the, the root to go deep. You know, there's ways to handle that in grace and in love, especially in people who are new and younger, and they don't know any better, right? But you've got to cut the weed off. You know, the only way to kill a dandelion, dandelion is not to just chop it off at the top. You've got to dig down and break the root. All right, and so what Paul does is the way he deals with this understanding and this blooming un uh, understanding of, 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 all right, Jesus might be the Messiah, but maybe he's not God, and maybe he's not really all that so much more. You know, he's just this other creation kind of thing. And you look at all these other heresies, all these other religions in the world, and we relegate Jesus to this place of humanity only, Right? We relegate him to this place where it is just this, you know, he's just a human, he's just a guy. So that's why they're able to make these weird movies out of Jesus. Maybe he was married, and maybe he was tempted and sinful and, 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 and living out sinful lives and those kind of things. But the reality of it is, that's not who Christ is. And so what Paul does is he lifts up Jesus to his proper place. We, he lifts up Jesus. L let, me, let me tell you about who this God is, and, 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 and he tells us about him. And so I love what Paul does here. If you walk through the passage, which we're about to do, is he just talks about Christ in relation to several different things in our world and, and, and about us and about God. And, uh, and, and so let's do that. Let's walk through that. Um, he makes profound, sweeping statements on Christ, and it's really beautiful to see. It right? hits it square in the jaw. So first, we're going to look at Christ in relation to deity. In other words, to the Godhead. You know, so it's this understanding that, well, maybe Jesus is just another guy. You know, maybe he's just like one of us. I mean, there are, there are religions and, and heresies out there. Um, you know, Mormonism. I mean, you know, Mormonism is really nice, but you realize they, they just think that Jesus was some other guy from some other universe who lived so well that he got his own Godhead. And that, by the way, you can too. It's crazy, right? And so we relegate Jesus, we relegate Jesus to that. Um, but look at how Paul deals with this. So back in, 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 starting in verse 15, Right, so, by the way, in verse 13 and 14, it makes it clear, right? Jesus, he rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. God did that. In whom we have redemption 
the forgiveness of sins. And talking about Jesus, he says this, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and the earth, visible and invisible, <clears throat> whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So he, he says he is the image of the invisible God. He's not talking about a copy. He's not talking about a less than God replica, right? He's making it very clear that when you see Jesus, you see God. You see God. The like, it, it, it means likeness, but also an understanding of manifestation or representation. Representation. He is, Jesus is God in the flesh. God in the flesh. And, and, and that didn't happen at the incarnation. You know, it was, in other words, at his birth, it wasn't like he was created uh, human and God. He has always been God, third, second person of the Trinity, always. But he took on flesh at the incarnation and, 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 and walked on this earth. So the Expositor's Bible Commentary says this, his incarnation did not make him the image of God, but it did bring him as being the image within our grasps. It brought the image of God to us. God in the flesh. Uh, you know, he, he, he walked among us, it says in John. John chapter 14, verse 9, says this. As Jesus is speaking... Even to his disciples, to Philip at this point, as Philip asks him, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. And then Jesus says this in verse 9. I got a, I got a verse for it. It says this. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? How, how, can, you, how can you look at me, Philip? Keep that up there. How can you look at that? How can you look at me, Philip, and not see God? Now, he's not talking about like you and I reflect Jesus. You know what I mean? He's not talking about reflecting God. He is God. He, he is the brightness of the sun. Jesus is not the moon, a reflection of God. Jesus is the sun. S-O-N, I mean S-U-N, the sun. And he, and, and he shines out the manifestation of God, if we can say it that way. And so that's where he is. Hebrews chapter 1, as uh, it talks about just for a clarity for us um, to understand this, in the beginning of Hebrews, he says this. He's talking about God, you know, God speaking. He says, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Listen to what it says. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Everything, he holds it all together, God. He is God. He is God. Um, he is God. Secondly, Christ in relationship to creation. So just even to understand the Godhead of Jesus, he goes into creation. Look at what he says. He says in verse, six, verse 16, for, for by him, I already read this, but again, for by him all things were created both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things hold together. So, I mean, get that. Understand the wording that he's using here. For by him all things were created. By him all things were created. Created Again, does not say in any way that Jesus was the, the first of God's creation. That's not what it's talking about in any way. When he says that he's before all things, it doesn't mean that you know, he's the first thing created. It means that he was literally before all things. He was here before all things were here. The only, there's only one thing that is here before all things are here, and that's God. That's God. 
And so he is God. As a matter of fact, I love what it says. I don't have this on the board, but I love what it says in John chapter 1 as it talks about Jesus and this understanding of deity. When, and, and we went through John several years ago, and I remember studying this. And for the first time, I was like, wow, I cannot believe. And I would say a Trinitarian statement that he makes here, only talking about God and Jesus, not the Holy Spirit. But look at what it says. John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the word. So if you're a Jew reading this, Again, they would understand that to not say like at, at the beginning, like, you know, just the first thing of the beginning, but before the beginning, in the beginning was the word. So what does that mean? That means it's God. All right. So John clarifies and he says this, and the word was with God. Wait a minute. If, if the only thing at the beginning is the word, then that's God. But then the word was with God. Wait, wait, maybe there's two. Maybe there was somebody hanging out with him. You know, maybe God brought another character. Maybe he created somebody else first, right? But just so we don't get confused on that, look at what he says. He says, and the word was God. Right? Now, again, that word Trinity uh, was coined in about the third century AD. You know, it was, it, was, it, it, it was a description of what Scripture had talked about, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right, so, so they didn't have those words then. They didn't want to, you know, but, but John's trying to make it clear. You know, in the beginning was the word. Okay, that must be God. Oh, and he was with God. Wait, that means he's, he's separate. You know, in other words, it's, it's not the Father, but he was God. Okay, that makes sense, right? Jesus is God. And so when it talks about in Colossians that, that, that for by him all things were created in the beginning, it was by his agency that they were created. That they were created. And so that's where Jesus is. When it says in verse 15, he's the firstborn of all creation. The Greek word there denotes priority and supremacy. Not like, you know, all right, what did I do first? Well, I created Jesus first. And then I, you know, it's not, it's not order as far as like one, two, three, four, five. It is, it is about supremacy. He is the overall supreme of all creation. And like I said, the next verse clarifies that. He's supreme in creation. Why? Because he made it. He made it. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or royals or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. It's interesting. There's three prepositional phrases that are used within verse 16 to define his creative activity. It says first in the beginning, by him. So by him all things were created. Right? Uh, it says, it, it, you know, as, as a commentary says, it occurred within the, uh, within the sphere of his person and power. He was its conditioning cause, its originating center, its spiritual locality. So by him, he creates. Later on, it says, through him, all things have been created through him. He is the mediating agent through which everything came into being. And then it says, for him. And that means in the, in the sense that he is the end for which all things exist. The goal toward whom all things were intended to move. He is supreme. Hanley uh, C.G. Mould said this. He said, they are meant to serve his will, to contribute to his glory. Their whole being, willing or unwilling, moves to him. Whether as blissful servants that they shall be known, or that they shall, as it were, his throne, be his throne, or his enemies, his stricken enemies, his footstool. All things. It says in Philippians chapter 2, that, that there will be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's everybody in heaven and on the earth and under the earth. There will be a day when you will see Jesus that nobody will be able to deny who he is. Now, for the one who hasn't known him as their savior on this earth, it will be in shock and horror because it will be in judgment. But it will not be, no, 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 I can't believe it. It will be, oh my goodness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. It will be an ugly day. All things 
toward him. Verse 17 really is a, is, a, is a summary of that. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I mean, you want to talk about supremacy over creation. And, and even as we talk about creation, we talk about God and creation, and we say he's the boss because he created everything, right? Well, there is Jesus. There is Jesus. All right, so he is God, right? That's where we've gone first, Christ in relation to deity, Christ in relation to creation, and then he talks about Christ in relation to the church. All right, he is God, and he is over all things in creation, right? So what about the church? Look at what he says. Verse 18, he is also the head of the body, the church, And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. He is head of the body. As as the sovereign Lord of all, he is the sovereign Lord of the church. And I've said this many times over the last several weeks, even in 2 Corinthians, as we talked about in that. You know, you have pastors and elders who lead this church, but we are not the shepherds. We are simply under shepherds to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the head of the body. And we are only legitimate, if I can say it that way, in that we follow his rule and we follow his ways. That's where we're legitimate. When we walk outside of God's parameters, then we need to be removed. We need to be removed. And, and actually, we have, a, we have a system in place in our body where if the pastor and the elders go rogue, the body can remove them. And, it, and it's really just a check and balance. It's not to be about, well, pastor changed the color of the carpet, which will never happen. I'll never change the color of the carpet. Because I won't ever make that decision. You can blame Fred and the deacons for that. Just so you know. <laughs> All right? But, um, but we get weird on decisions. Well, well, wait, they did this and they did that. And I didn't like how they did this. And I didn't ha- like how they did that. And, and, and all that. Listen, if you're looking for room for finding error you know, in, in behavior. I was talking to somebody the other day. And we were joking again. You know, I, I often joke about about driving on the LIE and driving on Sunrise Highway and driving on Long Island, right? And, and I really had my driving under control, and then I moved here nine years ago, and I, and I lost my salvation. Now, you can't lose your salvation, but I lost my religion in it, all right? But, I mean, I really did, and I was, we were just joking the other day, and I said, listen, if, if you judge me by what goes through my head while I'm driving, I would never be the pastor of this church. I would be removed tomorrow. I promise you, right? I promise you. That's right, take every thought captive, that's right. I try, and actually I praise God that I am to the point where I say something, and then I immediately say, you're an idiot, and I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about me. I mean, I do, I mean, I I haven't gotten to that place where it's not there at all, all right? Whew. I mean, I, I don't know. I think, I, think long, I think driving on Long Island, uh, long Island was meant to show us that we're not perfect. I'm just <laughs> convinced of that. <laughs> well, guess what? We're not perfect in all kinds of things. And there are times when we're not, we're not right. I mean, listen, life affects us. Life affects us as elders and as deacons. And sometimes we're not on, on our A game. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, one of the things I love, especially about our elders here and our deacons, but I mean, our elders are men who love the Lord. And are easily challenged. I mean, you know, are easily challenged. You know, this is not the perfect place because we're not the perfect one. Jesus is always right. And he always does it well. Right? And we're just seeking to emulate him. And and hopefully we're a little bit further along. I mean, good night. I've been a Christian for a long time. I mean, I do not look like, if you think I look bad now... And I don't just mean on the outside, people. Come on. Um, um, if you think I look bad at times now, you should have seen what I looked like 25 years ago. In my fervency for the Lord at times, because I knew the Lord and I loved him. All right? Now, it's really not about us. It gets back about Jesus. It's about the fact that he is the head of the church. He is the one. He's the one. And so when he says the church here, right, he means all God's people. All the people of God, the church universal. And I love how Paul, 
um, you know, describes the church. He describes it as what? We're not the team of God. We're the body of Christ. Winnie likes that. Do you, can you notice that? And, and so we've, we've talked about this before, actually. And uh, actually, a team illustration works at times for the church. All right? But ultimately, Christ describes it as what it is, and that's the body, where he is the head, he is the commanding one, he is the one who is supposed to be driving all the forces. And just like, especially when we get older, right? Um, you know, when, when we get older, sometimes our body doesn't always do what we want it to do. Can I get an amen? <laughs> right? Can I get an amen? I mean, right? I mean, like, you know, you're walking along and all of a sudden, you know, like, what happened? I don't know. My knee just gave out. You know, I didn't want it to. You, know, you didn't mean to do that. Right? Right? The body. Oh, the body. Right? And so just like that, sometimes the body doesn't always do what Christ wants it to do. But that doesn't mean he's any less the head. That doesn't mean he's any less in charge. That doesn't mean he's any less God. He is the head of the church. And he has given us his word so that we understand him. As the body is a living organism, it means that, that we carry out because, because we are his organism, because we are his people. We don't carry out our purposes. We carry out his purposes. Like we talked about in the book of Acts when we did it on a Thursday night. I, uh, uh, I forget who the quote was from. I think it was from somebody else, though. And he said, you know, um, um, God has... has um, has not made a purpose for the church. He's made the church for his purpose. We, we, are, we are made to carry out his purpose. We are, to, we, are, we are expected of God to be his representative. And therefore, therefore, we need to always bow to him, always continue to evaluate what we do, not based on what feels good to us, but based on what he says and what he doesn't say. And correct as necessary. And correct as necessary. Um, right? So, like we said, like I love that movement, I am second. Everything else takes second place to Jesus. Everything else. Everything else. <laughs> right? All right. So, Christ in relation to his deity, we understand that he is God. He is God. In creation, he is the creator of all things. He is the, the one. Just like we say, you know, we, we listen to God because he created us. That means he's the boss. Jesus is the boss. And then Christ, in relation to the church, he is head over us. And then Paul, just to get it further, says Christ in relation to us. So verse 19, this kind of goes into the church in that too, but... It says, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of Christ. Through him, I say, were there things on earth or things in heaven. Verse 21. And although you were formerly, talking about us, as all, although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. That gospel of Jesus Christ which saves us. Again, Paul, Paul, uh, Paul, Paul relates Jesus as fully God, right? And as God, he's the one who saves us. He reconciles us to God through his shed blood, through his fleshly blood. That's what it means. So Jesus Christ died on the cross, and in that, he paid the penalty for our sin. He took upon himself our penalty that we were due because of our sin. He reminds us that even though we were active in sin and rebellion, the blood of Jesus reconciled us. Y you know my favorite verse, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners. And, 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 and to me, to me that's what is big there for me. While we were yet sinners. Not when I was better. Not when I was good. 
Not when I had done something to God. Not when God said, all right, well, you know what? They're moving at least a little closer to me. I guess they deserve something now. When we deserved nothing, absolutely nothing, except, or actually, we did deserve something. We deserved his judgment, and we deserved to be a black spot on the ground, right? We deserved hell for an eternity, and yet by his grace, he saves us. By his grace, his blood applies to us, and it covers our sins. And, and you know my second favorite verse, right? Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, but he made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Do you see what it says in here, <laughs> right? You know, at, at verse 22, he has reconciled you in his fleshly body in order that you, to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. I like to tell people, there are no sinners in heaven. There is nobody with sin in heaven. Nobody. It's not because you were good enough, although I, I, I do also say there's two ways to heaven, right? If you can live this life and never commit any sin, you can go to heaven. That means nobody. There's not one of us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Paul says. Right? All of us. All of us have sinned. All of us deserve death. So then there, what's left? How do I get to heaven? I only get to heaven if you're righteous. Well, I don't have any righteousness. I got no righteousness. Then I need God's righteousness. I need Christ's righteousness. I need the, 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 the righteousness of Christ imputed upon me through, the, through, the, through faith in Jesus Christ alone by his blood. So his blood washes me clean. I love what it says in the book of Revelation that there are those who stand before God with robes washed white as snow by the blood of the Lamb. I don't know about you, but if you wash something in blood, it usually doesn't make it white. But if you wash something with the blood of Jesus, it cleanses completely. <laughs> completely. So that therefore there is nothing else needed for your salvation. Nothing. Well, don't I got to come to church every Sunday? And now this is really dangerous waters for the pastor to say, but no, not for your salvation, for your growth in Christ, absolutely. <laughs> for your sanctification, absolutely. Christ commands us to be involved in the body, but you don't come to church so that you can then, all right, I know I, I was saved by grace, but maybe now I'll get to a place where I deserve it. <laughs> you will never get to a place where you deserve it, ever. It is only by his grace, only by his blood, only by his love. <laughs> so again, those of us who are all of us, all of us who are in a church, all of us who are part of the body of Christ, <laughs> are those who have been rebellious, are those who have been sinful, are those who deserve death, deserve judgment, and deserve hell. And by his grace, we are saved. By his stripes, we are healed. Enemies of God are now friends. As a matter of fact, we're now children, like we talked about a few weeks ago. And, and, and that means we're all brothers and sisters. Like I like to tell people, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Right? And that's especially, you know, you, you, may, you may not like somebody in the body of Christ. And I'm pretty sure God, and listen, this is outside of anything biblical, okay? I just happen to think God might have a good enough sense of humor to li make you live next to them, <laughs> right? So we might as well like them now, right? We might as well like them now. That doesn't mean you have to hang out with everybody all the time. I get that, all right? So all we do then, so Jesus is our all in all, right? If, if he's God, and he's Lord over all creation, and he's Lord over the church, and the only reason that we have part and parcel of God in any way is by the blood of Jesus Christ, then he is to be our all in all. Then what else are we to do except to lift him up and to exalt him? How do we do anything else but to give praise to his name? How do we do anything else but to, but to raise Jesus higher, to raise him higher, to raise him glorious and, 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 and as God and as king, as the one to be seen because he is the one to, that saves. It's 
It's not about me. It's not, getting, not me getting a platform. It's not me getting something. Somebody once said some people use the tr- cross of Jesus Christ not so that they can lift it higher, but so that they can climb it high and can be seen by others. <laughs> How dare we? This is not about us. This is about him. And so his church, as his church, as his body, <laughs> we need to raise up Jesus because he's our all in all. Because outside of Christ, I have no hope. I have no hope in, in a future. I have no hope in, in, in a real future. All right? I have no hope. Because as, as well as you will do on this earth, it will end one day. As well as you do on this earth, it will be silenced. <laughs> and all the degrees and all the money and all the houses and all the buildings named after you, you know, one day, even if you're dead and there's a building named after you, one day it'll crumble. <laughs> Look at all the civilizations of, of, of old. It's amazing. You know, we do excavations all the time around the world to dig up that which was buried. <laughs> and every once in a while, somebody's name's on it. You know, somebody's name is written down and we have something recorded and, and it goes in into antiquity. And that's where it stays. Jesus is our all in all. So exalting Christ must be our guiding principle. And, 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 and it needs to be our evaluation. Is what I'm doing, is what I'm saying, is how I'm living exalting Jesus. And when it is not, we need to come up short. We need to ask for forgiveness for that. And then we need to get whatever we need to get right so that it will. And, and again, we're all in process, and I get that. We're in a different process, and, 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 but that's not an excuse either, right? I mean, even as I joke about the LIE, that's not an excuse, you know, and we all laugh about it. And the reason why I bring up the LIE is because most of you do, you know, are, are the same way. I mean, maybe not most of you, but a lot of you. <laughs> I've driven with some of you, I know, <laughs> right? You know, so it's easy to pick on. But the reality of it is, is that we understand that we're not there yet. Just like Paul understood that. Not that I've obtained it yet, but I, but I press on. I press on so that my life might be a shining example of Christ and Christ alone. I press on that my life might lift up Jesus in everything I do. And if God gives me a voice on this earth, in any way, whether it's by a talent or by a job or by a, you know, something that you're involved in, if God gives us a voice, may it be a voice for him. May it be a voice that ultimately exalts Christ. And, and sometimes that means not only in my speaking, that means in my job. You know, Christians need to be the best employees ever. Right? Because we exalt Christ in our job, in our life, in our family, in our homes, even when no one's around. It needs to be our guiding principle. We understand that in this church. Like I said, I, I think we're invested in that, but we're, but we're becoming more invested in that as we raise Jesus up and we exalt him alone.